Hi everyone, my name is Matt from Forefront and welcome to this virtual panel titled Redefining Government Workplaces. So we have received a great response with over 100 senior government workplace leaders registered to watch live, which is great news, so a big welcome to everyone. But before I hand you over to our expert panel, I just wanted to highlight that we are trying to make this discussion as interactive as possible. So you'll notice on the screen on your right hand side that you have the ability to send in questions, vote on questions and answer live polls. So please get involved because it really does add to the conversation and our moderator will be feeding it back to the panel. So it's now my great pleasure to introduce you to our panel. So we have Amy Chu, who's the Director of Property and Workplace Experience at New South Wales Health. Peter Lee Benson, who's Head of Digital Workplace at iCare New South Wales. Sadia Mishra, who's the General Manager of People and Capability at Semitex, and moderated by Andrew Hurt, who's the Managing Director at Poly. So thanks everyone, and now over to you, Andy. Thank you very much, Matt. And it's great to be here uh, to moderate this session today. Uh, obviously, it's, a, it's an incredible experience that we've all been working through the last 15 months or so, especially in the last eight months with uh, the pandemic hitting worldwide, but specifically all our organisations, um, and has forced us into situations that we're, we're, we're not used to, um, being forced into um, ways of, of working that we didn't expect to be working, um, business continuity plans that, uh, that aren't in a manual that we've all read in university or, or done anything along those lines, um, and we've been executing um, our jobs in such a different way that has impacted our, our work practices, have, has impacted our technology, and, and also the culture of our, our businesses have been impacted also. Um, and this is a topic today that obviously has been over-debated. But what we wanted to do today is set up a, a, a forum or a conversation that allows us to talk about topics that We've all been um, thinking about instituting our organisations, but using industry experts like Matt just talk, talked about um, to help us with that conversation and put some of these ideas in play. So I'd like him to, to introduce and give, give it, each of the panellists a chance to just to, first of all, introduce themselves, but also to just talk about their role in their organisation and the lens that they've taken on their experience over the last eight months. So if I could, Sadia, ask you just to, to talk about yourself a little and also your, uh, your organisation um, and how you've been dealing with things over the last eight months. Thanks, Andrew. Um, so yes, um, uh, good, good morning all and uh, welcome, welcome to this session. Um, really topical uh, conversation and uh, particularly here in Victoria, uh, it's been uh, an amazing, amazing, um, very surreal uh, last eight, uh, eight months um many, many challenges uh, some some expected and many many uh totally unexpected but uh, rising to this challenge and being adaptive has been our focus in the last uh, over the last six to eight months uh, obviously from a very strong people perspective and also health and well-being perspective so just by way of introduction i work for sanitex and our sanitex is a um ICT, so uh, 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 provider to the Victorian government and uh, its associated agencies. We reach out our products and our offerings reach out to roughly 46,000 odd end user customers, uh, mainly in the sense of propping up government and its IT, IT, ICT services. Um, as we can imagine, in the last eight months, this particular offering and, and, and what we do for the BPS, the Victorian public sector, has really come to the forefront with the majority of the workforce now going home, working remotely, uh, and requiring all of those platforms that they were probably using and beyond. So getting, getting used to the infrastructure, making sure that it's foolproof, and making sure that uh, the uh, productivity of not just our company, our organization, but the BPS also, is, is maintained uh, and, and sustained. So that was probably the uh, first part of um, our challenge when it when it hit. Yeah. Um, so just at the end of uh, April, uh, majority of our workforce all of a sudden, it, uh, it came to a standstill. We were um, sent home or, 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 or directed home. And um, at that time, we experienced what we sort of fondly refer to as the burning platform. 
um, there were services, there were there were offerings, there was digitization. They were all on the plan. There were they, 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 we had we had worked through progressing those product offerings to 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 various degrees, but all of a sudden it became imminent. So things we had planned to roll out over the next twelve to eighteen months, we needed overnight. So um, it, it was quite interesting, and we'll talk about that more in detail later. But those um, the, the 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 reactive the um, um the, the 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 rapidness of that response was something that really uh presented us with a lot of challenges but at the same time was really exciting and gave us a lot of opportunities as well oh, so thank, you, been no, thank you Sadia. thank you for the introduction and uh obviously it's been a busy time and uh we'll get into that into some of the, some of the questions later so peter lee obviously from your side has been uh, a challenge as well so how how have you coped and what uh uh, angle have you had on your business? Yeah, thanks, Andrew. So I work for um, ICARE, which is Insurance and Care New South Wales. Uh, we we had um, some significant challenges over this period, not just around COVID. I, I won't mention the other challenges that we've had, but um, we've we've really done very well in in pivoting to what we needed to do over this period. Um, early on, we all, we really just drew drew on our digital workplace strategy that we already had in place, which was um, which was quite a significant strategy. It was to take over two two and a half years to implement, so it really just advanced that quite quickly. Um, um, we had a lot of great things already in place. We had to pivot on some things, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but uh, really just stayed the course on where we were going anyway um, around that flexible working. So with a great team behind me, we were able to implement quite things quite quickly, um, which I think was the name of the game at that time, you know, getting things in as quickly as possible and as fast as possible. One of the things that we needed to make sure of is that we could still um, provide the services to our, our our essential services that we do for our participants for lifetime care. So we do a lot of lifetime care for people from workers' compensation, uh, workers' insurance side of things. And that was our, our primary aim is to make sure that they keep going and keep up and running. So providing them the, the equipment that they needed um, and ensured that they had the focus that they needed to, to pivot to work from home um, and keep up that that care services that they really needed to provide. So, you know, we had to, to um, ensure that some of our, our, um, our platforms were ready to be, be used at home, particularly our contact centre services. Um, and that was no easy feat, um, as you can probably appreciate, but the majority of our other services were, were all ready to go from, for remote working. So we'll talk a little bit about more about that later on but you know I think over this time very very proud of um, not only my own team digital workplace team but also the way that um, I was part of the pandemic team so the pandemic response team as well and how we collaborated and communicated together and we, we solved problems and I think that's what made it so successful in the end just to having um, the right people in the room to talk about things and make decisions at the right levels as well. Oh thank you Peter Lee obviously the uh the transitional uh, plans that you had in place were accelerated beyond um, expectation. And I'll talk a little bit about that in my intro also. So Amy Chu, if you could give an intro. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Amy and I work for um, New South Wales Health. So I look after their property and their workplace experience team. Um, so that's basically a team that looks after not just facilities, reception, but the employee experience as people come um, into work. Um, I guess with New South Wales Health, we never really had an off switch. We've been um, a business and we were very fortunate because um, more recently we've moved into a brand new building and that all that whole move took place during um, COVID as well. And leading up to this great big move, which was um, we did a whole big push out around activity based working rolled out laptops. We had a number of agencies that, and groups of people that still didn't even have basic laptops to use. Um, so we were very, very fortunate to have done that. And at the same time, um, pushing forward um, things like Microsoft Teams and Office 365 and things like that, which also took place remotely as well when we were um, in our, right in the heart of the pandemic. So I guess for us, um, in terms of business continuity, you know, everything like everyone else has just mentioned um, was fast tracked. So some of the things that we thought would take some time and be able to churn through, um, came forward a lot faster and in some ways to our benefit the COVID probably helped 
people's um you know were more open to new things mm. and certainly that made it a lot easier for us to um adapt to the change but i i think um for us it was a balance of you know the messaging out there was everyone worked from home but there were some of us or quite a few of us that still had to come in to deal with the emergency operations how health would deal working with other agencies to work through how i guess the communities will work through um during COVID as well so um i was unfortunate um when they announced the lockdown i was actually in bali on a flight on the way back and made it seven hours too late and had to shut down and work from home for two weeks and then lock down together with everyone else after that too and so it was certainly a test for all of our systems to see that suddenly i think even from basic things like um you know skype for business calls we had we were averaging 400 a week to suddenly 200,000 a week like insane statistics like that and seeing if the system would cope so I think for us, we were very proud about how we were able to manage all that and for everyone just to get on with it and work through it all. But um, I guess now we're in different phases now as to, you know, how do we go about working day to day now with, you know, the world's not going to be the same again, so. No. Yeah. Amy, thank you so much. And and thank you all for your introductions. And, and it does validate one great thing, and that is that uh, it doesn't matter which sector or which organisation you work in, the challenges are, generally and overall the same in regard to you were forced into situations that you not necessarily had specific plans for in the past. You may have plans that you thought you may have adopted too, but they were accelerated beyond belief. I mean, the, a great example is, is the CEO of, of Microsoft said that, uh, that, that two years of digital transformation happened in two months. And the strain of that in organisations and the industry as all, well, um, it's incredible how resilient we all are, um, as in resilient how the industry is, but also organisations' ability to be able to capacity plan and change um, at a, a at a very um, small period of time. Um, Peter Lee, you used the term pivot. There's been a lot of organisations that literally had to turn to either 180 or 90 degree changes in their strategies overnight and that was something which we've heard as an organization um, poly is an organization that has that creates endpoint equipment and man manufactures hardware uh, we had to then ma make major changes to how we supply chain a lot of our business um, technology and how we shipped it around the world we had to go from air freight to sea freight we had to uh, take orders that we didn't anticipate um, and the volume and meeting the market demand was so incredibly high. But we, there are technologies these days that have allowed us to, to work with organisations in such a transformational way. Um, but the great thing is, we've been running a lot of these sessions, um, we, we've found and done surveys and, and reports, which you'll have access to um, uh, uh, after this session, is that you'll have a, have, a, have, a, have a hybrid working report that shows that, that most organisations are going through three phases. The first one is responding to the challenge, or for that matter, really that disruption phase, they've done the best they could at the disruption that was caused and kept the business going the best they could, grabbing technology, um, putting people in situations like working from home, et cetera, um, and the best they could and that first phase of responding to that challenge. You've all mentioned a couple of those things, but there are a couple of angles I'd love to go through. And Amy, um, if I could go back to you, um, obviously with responding to the challenge, you had a lot of uh, plans in place with moving uh, your business into one building. You had, I think, 3,000 employees or something moving into a building. How did you prioritise what was already in place to then say, well, this is obviously have to be put on hold or this would change. How did you um, uh, prioritise some of these actions? And how did, how did the staff, and from a cultural perspective, um, deal with that, that challenge? Yeah. First and foremost, I think it was really important for the team around me that were, I guess, charged with bringing everyone back into the building, were um, felt safe and were supported because here we were saying it was very difficult. Initially, we did a lot of work um, from home separately and I, I think we spent 99% of that time on the phone and it was really difficult because I'd talk to someone, talk to someone else and um, we then sort of moved into a phase where we just 
decided we actually needed to work together face in a you know in the office to be able to plan and um you know bring 3000 people into a building um you know we had situations where we had leases ending so there was a scenario where we still had to get staff from other buildings to go back into their office to pack their belongings um, and you know phasing that during um, a crisis is really difficult but giving people the option that you know if you don't feel comfortable coming back into the office we will organize for the removalists to because they were deemed essential workers to be able to pack and you know produce you know, pack items for them um, so it was really important that our staff felt my team felt safe because we were pretty much charged with you know bringing everyone into this building and I think for us, it was also then um, getting people back into the building bit by bit to test the systems. You know, this is a brand new building, brand new IT system. They have to feel comfortable that all their um, things can work. So it was, re you know, organ getting really quick about monitoring everyone's working progress digitally as well. So looking at the tools, getting people trained up on certain tools because um, we were moving from, you know, we discovered that talking on the phone and meeting face to face, we needed to be keep track of everyone's movements and everyone had their own personal um, things that were happening that sometimes they may not be available. And so working around that was um, really challenging. But once we were on top of that, we were able to quickly get people on board. We rethought how do we get people inducted and familiar with space we organised for um, videos, streaming, so we got um, similar to when you want to buy a house, you know, you get videos where you can move around a building. We did that for a commercial building, so we did floors in our building so that people, staff could familiarise themselves with virtually um, before they actually came face to face to a building. Mm -hmm. We Simple things that you think like even certain, um, down to, um, I guess, if you were an emergency evacuation person, like a first aider, getting that training done online. Um, so people were trained as fire wardens virtually before they even came to a building. So there were lots of different things that you just wouldn't think about that um, I think the whole world stepped up to in terms of creating programs that people could access online. So in, in that phase, you had obviously responded to the challenge. You still had mm -hmm. people working from the office and at home yes. in, in, in that environment. So yeah. you never went 100% one way. So no. it was very adaptive. And that is obviously what we're seeing. But obviously, you're having to change the the density levels on floors, density levels in your planning. And did that happen? The same thing happen in your in in uh, conference rooms and technology in those being adapting to video yeah. and voice. Absolutely. So when we moved in, we rapidly we realised that. So we had obviously video conferencing facilities in the building. Um, but with everyone working virtually most of the time, we then went to a retrofit stage where we, we had a brand new building all set up and um, we retrofitted a probably, I think, I would say 50% of the um, meeting rooms again. To, we had smaller meeting rooms that didn't have video conferencing facilities. So we had to quickly get that um, up and running mm -hmm. as well to respond to, I guess, the demand. And at the same time, um, you know, we've got capacity you know now a lot of people are using we've, we've reduced you know the number of people that can come into meeting rooms and certainly you know even today we've got we we average over 1500 people a day coming into this building okay. still so we certainly um i know organizations that have 50 people so it's it's yeah. a real challenge for us yeah Thank, thanks amy i'll come back to a couple of points you just mm -hmm. made a bit later when we're talking about the reinventing but mm -hmm. um peter lee you, you mentioned in your intro about um contact centers and call centers uh and the challenge you had with with having to obviously from a business continuity perspective ensure that that they're going to keep up the work and the and the customer interaction and ensure that you don't lose that momentum in customer contact. Um, how did you, how did that uh, change for you in that respond phase and that real okay? How do we deal with this right now, especially with something that's so business critical as as dealing with your customers and ensuring that they don't lose contact with you? 
Yeah, so one of the first things we had to actually do, um, our contact centres were in an office environment and a lot of them were actually on desktop as well. So one of the first things we actually had to do is make sure they all had laptops. Um, that was no easy feat with the supply, um, supply chain constraints that I'm sure everybody actually um, were, was undergoing. But luckily we had a great uh, relationship with our supplier. So, and, I, and you know, I can't, you know, I can't promote that enough about the relationships that we have with our partners and suppliers, which really did bring us through uh, this as well. Um, but yes, making sure that they had the equipment, they were they had the additional monitors that they needed at home to really make sure that they were servicing the customer at the level that they needed to service. Um, we set up uh, some remote uh, support for them, making sure that our end user compute was there to support them whenever they needed it. Um, but also the platform itself, the platform was not designed to be a remote platform, but we were able to actually uh, through, th through auto magically, uh, making sure that we could actually get them at working at home on the platform via VPNs, et cetera, in a secure environment. Because if you remember, we are actually working for health, uh, you know, in the health area, and we need to also make sure that everything that we do is secure and that information is always kept secure. So there was a lot of moving parts and it, there was a lot of complexity. We brought together a crack team. It was made up of, oh, I think about 20 people in the end that uh, really had to focus on the problem. Um, and within a couple of weeks, we had everybody up and running one of the things that we also had to ensure, uh, I think as well, and each of the business areas did this was from a leadership perspective. They also had to make sure that they could respond in kind to make sure their own people were doing what they needed to do. So I didn't have as much visibility on that side, but it was something that we, they did focus on to make sure that people were actually, um, you know, making sure they were logging on and making sure that they were okay to do the work that they had to do on a daily basis. Um, one of the things that um, we have done since that time is we also have a lot of people on the road. So we have people that normally would go out to our participants and do an appointment with them in their home. So we've also had to make sure that we can actually provide uh, the level of technology where they can do that from a telehealth perspective as well. So, and that's a matter of actually a bit of retraining. So it's not just giving them the technology, but actually training on the best use of how you do a Teams meeting, how the participants can actually get onto Teams, for instance, as well, has been a key part of that. So it's not just been from the employee perspective, but also our, our participant perspective as well. So yeah, lots of moving parts. We've had an interesting question from the from the floor here, and in regard to um, he health and safety, um, when you do move people or, and had to move people into their home, um, obviously you had a you had a panel of people that you worked with to get um, to ensure that we'll, you're covering all business continuity and getting things up and going. Obviously, one aspect of that would have been um, occupational health and safety in the change that you had to go through, that reactive stage that you had to go through from working in the office to then working from home. How did you approach that? Um, so occupational health and safety was was basically coming along with the, with us on the journey. They were part of a lot of the decisions that had to be made. I'm not sure if we actually nailed that yet. I think that's an ongoing issue for most organisations when we're now in this hybrid environment where people are in the office and working from home, and that's not going to change. So it is something that I think needs more focus. But we already had forms in place, so we were already getting into this flexible way of working. So we um, made sure that those forms and those policies that we had in place were fit for purpose right. for the environment that we we're in. Um, we encouraged people to make sure that they were checking in, and leaders were able to check in and make and ask those critical questions. You know, do you you have the right setup? Do you have everything that you need? Um, and, and just making sure that they do that on a regular basis. As I said, I think that's there's still an area that we need to work on as we go into you know this this new phase, the new normal as they call it. Yeah. Um, and you know, I don't think we've nailed it just yet, but I think we've um, we've made sure that people are looking after themselves at the same time. One of the things that I've just come back from is a nice digital detox. I think that's, uh, I've had four days off where I did not look at my, my um, 
mobile phone, my iPad, my laptop are all shut down. And I think that's something that we're going to have to start encouraging people as well, because it's not just about where they sit at their desk and making sure they've got the right equipment, but it's also the mental health aspects of things. We need to start encouraging people to just to get off digital if yeah. they are going to be working from home um, and give them some advice around that. They can't just expect people to naturally know how to shut themselves off from, from the world and get back into nature. But it is yeah. an important conversation that needs to be had. Because I think there's a great term of of the fact that I think the that that conference fatigue um, and the, the 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 gap between meetings is much smaller. Um, there's not a lot of um, that personal touch level of of going from one meeting to the other, and and you start an agenda straight away. Some of those work practices have changed. And if I could segue across to sit here, um, obviously from from your perspective. Um, segueing through the Victorian experience is obviously um, adding a new complexity where you were in lockdown, came out of lockdown in a particular way and then went back into it. Um, for ability, actually, I think I've just lost um, sit here, unfortunately. So um, have Peter Lee, have you, have, is it just my end or is he lost? Is he um, off? No, I can't see sit here. Okay. I think he's gone. All right. Well, I will, I will. Uh, Pivot uh, in 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 my questioning across to uh, to Amy. I, um, if I could, um, obviously some of the challenges that we've we've seen in the in the cultural piece um, is has been a little bit difficult in being able to adapt to that that human aspect and the and the fatigue level that probably has been seen. Um, Amy, have you seen have you seen any of of that coming into play? And has there been any any anything that the um, that your organisation has done to assist with with that um, in helping the employees from a HR and cultural perspective yeah. cope with that fatigue. Yeah. Um, we have done a few things, and um, more recently, we are also establishing our mental health first aiders as well. Oh. So training people from a number of not just um, age groups but demographics as well, so that people can feel comfortable talking to people, and and certainly. Um, you know, we're in a situation where some people haven't come into the office for, you know, many months and suddenly people a few uh, for the first time and working with people. And I think even um, my observations personally, I think some people even forgot how to work with other people and have conversations with people. And, um, you know, many reasons for that, whether it's their home situation or whatnot. But what we've done also is, um, you know, given some of the managers tools to help have conversations around um, I guess, um, you know, where, where staff are coming from, that everyone's, you know, in a different family situation, giving them more flexibility around arrival times, um, giving them, making them feel comfortable that they have these options available to them. Because there is obviously the stigma of, you know, in, in certain areas in the business about, you know, if you're not seeing how are you doing your work. Um, so helping some of the managers who may have not done it, more, more the leadership sort of like the intangible aspects of managing um, that they need to have these conversations and you know even being interestingly enough having some of the managers even saying I'm spending so much time managing now and I'm like well that's actually your job and I think um, it's a big shift for some people that are finding they're actually spending a lot more of their week now having conversations with their staff around aspects that don't actually have to do with work itself um, so doing things like that, trying to encourage people to have online kind of morning teas, virtual sessions. Mm. Christmas is coming up, you know, everyone wants to have togethers. We're just saying, you know, have these um, virtually, looking at opportunities. I know um, some groups look at giving people kudos online. It's also rewarding people virtually as well. Some people feel like they're doing a lot of great work, but it's not mm. by people because now you're not in the office for people to say, hey, um, you've done a great job. So it's it's you know um, yeah some of the leadership aspects that have had we've had to work on as well quite quickly, that's, mm -hmm. and that's a really good um, uh, segue if I could, Sadia. Mm -hmm. um, I, I you did drop out. I, I changed the, the the angle of the question across to Amy, um, but from a from a managerial and, and Amy made a really really good point about the the shift and 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 transition that managers that have been managing a certain way for a long time, they've been managing via um, you know, almost like 
you know, if I see you, you're doing your job. If I don't see you, you're not doing your job. So the whole change of managing output rather than input um, has been a major shift we've seen um, in a lot of the survey results we've seen. How, how have you, on the people side and the people management side, um, what are your observations? Very similar. And and sorry about the dropout. That's, uh, that, that was one of the challenges of um, um, working across platforms as well. Um, we've had very similar experiences with ours as well. They're very traditional um, ICT company, uh, very traditional perspectives on work and productivity. So um, to, to start off with, there was a lot of apprehension about the unknown. Um, traditionally, there was this uh, perception of uh, if I don't see you, then productivity obviously, you know, is, is not uh, in my control. So changing that mindset sometimes is quite difficult. But once again, uh, in the Victorian context, we were forced to rethink. Um, so in, in many ways, when I compare ourselves to the New South Wales experience, our experience was much harder. But that actually gave us more opportunities as well, because there was very little we could do. We were actually enforced. So we were locked out, um, and and in that absence, in, in that forced change, data spoke. So, for example, I'll, we have a service center as well, very very similar to yourself, better, and um, we have um, uh, that's that's one place where we were working on traditional desktops, but within the first three uh, to four weeks of of flipping flipping the switch and providing uh, our, our service center work, workers with, uh, with with the equipment, etc. Um, all, all the productivity um, uh, surveys actually gave us some astounding feedback. The, the, the data coming back was actually far more positive than it traditionally was over the last two or three years. So data like that really is powerful for managers to change their perspective. So traditionally, I would be, um, you know, if, if there was one who would be uh, quite averse to um, um, no, not having line of visibility, hang on, here's the data, it actually works. But then also on the flip side, providing those managers with supports in managing remotely, because it's a new concept for those managers as well. So uh, retraining those managers, um, including them in power groups, like Peter mentioned earlier, um, where, when, when, when this happened, the pandemic uh, management committee was, uh, was very quickly set up and, and the representation on that committee was, um, uh, was quite far reaching. And the very managers who probably would have been, and, and we know our managers quite closely, who may have been um, inherently opposed to these sort of um, um, changes, were invited on the panel so that they had their say, not only that they could hear the flip side of the argument, they could actually analyze the data together. And uh, just slowly the mindset changes, but particularly in our context, it was quite forced. Uh, yeah. And, and uh, I embraced that because I thought sometimes <laughs> having a forced line of thinking is better than, uh, so, um, yeah. So, so dear, when, when, now I've still got you, I'm going to make sure that I'm just going to ask you a question because the last 15 minutes, I really do want to focus on the attention of, of the things that you've experienced in your organisation, but also you've experienced in the industry of, of some of the really exciting things and thinking positively about what on the road ahead. Um, thinking about the positive aspects of some of the changes you've seen that you will be taking and adopting in your organisation, whether it be from a process perspective of working differently um, from a uh, how the process would work or from human behavior or cultural perspective or technology what 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 would you see as the as the real um, exciting practices that you would put into place so you are putting into place that you probably wouldn't have um, 12 months ago and how quickly you're going to be able to execute on those Look, I think I think there will be a couple of uh, pressing and immediate um, things facing uh, the HR uh, practice. One of them is remote working is a reality. Um, there was there was a lot of debate over 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 decades, maybe, but de definitely over the last few years. Remote working is here. Um, there was an interesting question I think um, that someone had posted up a little earlier about how do you um, manage staff who actually want to come back in. So remote working is a reality. Um, and first and foremost, providing the right infrastructure to support that seamlessly is vital because there's nothing worse than not providing the right tools um, to, to your staff and expecting to respond like um, any other organization will. So for us, that means Sanitex, but also the VPS, our customers as well. So the right technology, right platform and, and secure. So th th those are a couple of things. But secondly, working out. So at the moment, there's a, a, a lot of emphasis we are placing on human-centered design um, within our workforce. So 
involving the employees in the decision and process reinvention. That is what we have, and, and, and data sort of leads to that too, but we've noticed during, so over, over the last uh, three months or so, we've been running a series of surveys, well-being surveys um, and, and health surveys across the business. And one of the overwhelming things that came through was the disconnect. All the people were loving working um, from home, loving the lack of commute and all of those other luxuries that were remote working uh, presents us with. The lack of collaboration seemed to be something that was losing connectivity. And, and that's where a lot of emotional well-being and things were coming into play. But the resounding um, the, the data was that staff were feeling that they were no longer having an input, direct input in changes that are happening in the workplace because they couldn't see it. So, um, so in, involving people in the people design that we affect the people uh, is most vital. We never underestimate that. So that's that's a philosophy we are taking with our with, with our staff. Uh, but but from a HR and talent perspective, it is presenting us with a real opportunity now to reinvent recruitment, reinvent skills and resourcing that we require that we now understand we require not in the next five years but over the next two. So traditionally, um, you know, the recruitment team would be, um, you know, by hel helping managers getting like for like, someone leaves, someone comes in. But at the moment, there's a lot of work on skills matrix, skills mining. What are the skills of the future, particularly in our industry? Um, where do we get them from? Where do we get yeah. these resources from? Are they, um, you know, for, for example, cybersecurity coding, it, it, it's exponentially the, the need for that and the unknown is expon exponentially risen. Does university curriculum actually have that? on the agenda at the moment. Some of the skills required are probably not even being explored at tertiary level. So where do, I, where do we get our next generation from? And so, potentially the remote and hybrid environment has allowed you to open the net to, to cast much wider geographically to ensure that you can actually get those types of skills anywhere in the world, let alone you know, just locally. Absolutely, and and also understanding and accepting that we can't be we, we don't have answers to everything. So yeah. the the um, the reliance on trusted partners out there. So so for for example, we are exploring ways of um, uh, probably providing our own education and training and creating our own. Um, so instead of looking at your traditional graduates, in instead of looking at your traditional um, uh, resources out there in the industry, which are very getting thinner and thinner for the resources we require for the future. Let's create our own training and development. So our learning and development is going off into a different trajectory as well. Terrific. From, so dear, yeah, well, thank you so the, much. They're really good insights. I think we can you know, see some really good examples in my summary. I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll touch on a couple of those. Uh, Peter Lee, um, from your perspective, some of those um, great insights that obviously the councils and things that you've been involved with um, are looking to implement long term. Um, some of the change and the topic of this session today is all about the workspace redesign and rethink. Um, from the office layout perspective also, um, the technology in your rooms and the technology at your desk, and, you know, have that, has that changed? And, and also for that matter, where do you see things really exciting moving forward? Um, in the workspace? Yeah, um, I think we're still on on course to actually continue on with our meeting room technology the way that we we envisaged. Um, we we were already in the upgrade mode. We similar to Amy's organisation, we'd already gone through an activity based working for some of our parts of our organisation. Uh, yet to decide on whether or not that expands out. But the meeting room technology just became more of a focus because, um, and I think someone had a question around how do you actually get these. Uh, the, our, our members to work hybrid as well as in the office and have that collaboration still ongoing. So more so meeting room technology is going to be critical. It needs to be stable and it needs to ensure that people are feeling connected no matter where they are. So whether or not people are working from a home environment or working in the office, some of that is actually about behavioural change and there's some unconscious bias that I have seen come through when there is, say, three people in a meeting room, three people at home, those in the meeting room still tend to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. So we've got to really change those behaviours and start actually educating people. And it is unconscious. That's that's natural. People are feeling those connections um, in you know in person. So it's going to be a bit of education, I think, and it's going to be a bit of uh, education for those in the remote space to say, 
you know, hey, look at me, I have an yeah. opinion. And some of the, the techniques that, you know, we've been looking at is potentially start with people in a remote environment when you're going around a table. So round tables start with the remote environment. Who came on first to encourage uh, or who's got their video conference camera on? That's Those types of techniques. Don't mute um, your video is a big yeah, one. <laughs> that's right. And to Sahir's point, um, you know, data is key to a lot of those behavioural changes. Um, one of the great things that Microsoft has done, we're a Microsoft environment, and I'm sure Google and um, similar have gone down this path, is provide an, a huge amount of additional analytics that we never had access to before. So now we can see, you know, groups of people who have their cameras on versus who don't, not from a big brother perspective, but really to start encouraging, well, why would you turn your camera on? How do you get that connection in the office versus remote? And start using that data to really change people's behaviours, but also giving them a reason to change their behaviours using HCD uh, techniques as well. We're, we're very much using those techniques as well. So it's becoming more and more critical that meeting room technology is able to keep pace with the behavioural changes that we need in this hybrid workspace. One of the things that I'm really excited about that we're really looking at at the moment is power platforms, um, in, in particular the hyper -automa automation. So hyper automation is, is really a focus area. How do we automate as much as we possibly can? And um, I think that's, uh, that's, that's the future. That's, I think, the next iteration of where we're going with these platforms as we go into the future and reinvent what that new normal will look like. Um, and that includes the meeting room technology, automating a lot of that. And Microsoft has uh, uh, some amazing plans around that. So um, along with the other platforms as well, not to, I um, don't want to just no, fly okay. Microsoft's flag. <laughs> that's okay. We're, we're, not, we're not on the ABC. We don't have to. <laughs> the, uh, the whole point here is though that the, um, I think the analytics and being able to see it and, and feel it and have the experience difference between being comfortable in front of a camera um, is a big yeah. thing too. And I think a lot Absolutely. of people are being forced down that and, and actually much more comfortable than they used to be. But I really yeah. like your insights in, in, in that we have, we're going to be seeing a lot more data come out and give us that data. We need to look at it and analyze it. And I, mm -hmm. I, I think that's a, a really big um, uh, a big way forward, especially in the customer interaction side that you're talking about. There's also a flip side to that, and that is we're trying to get people to self-serve more in the organisation, um, and that that is go and search for the information you need rather than be handed mm. the information, which is what we've had to do in the past, you know. But part of that is also getting used to us having these analytics. Artificial intelligence is here to stay. So we need to get people starting to be comfortable. And this is probably where we need people like his team to help the digital teams to actually start educating people on artificial intelligence, on automation, and, and really getting comfortable with it because it's not going away. People have to start being comfortable with the fact that they might have, you know, uh, some robotic automation answering their question in the future, or we might have visibility of them having their camera off versus not having it on. Yes. So, yeah. you know, that's that's here to stay. So, you some know, really you've got good to get comfortable with that. Nope. Yeah. Great, great insights. Thank you, Kelly. That's great. Amy, what are the practices that you're going to see, you're going to be able to really double down on that the uh, that you've seen um, as exciting for plans and strategies in the future for you and your organisation? Look, I, I think, I mean, listening to Peter Lee and Sidia as well, um, you know, the whole, not just the remote working aspect, but the flexible working aspect as well. So it's not just about working away from the office, but at different times of the day. You know, people want to spend more time with their family so that it might be, you know, logging on early in the morning if you can, do some work, drop your kids off at school, come back to work, log on later. So I think the way we work in terms of times of the day will change. Um, I think data, absolutely, with the data, we're now collecting a lot of data on when people come into the office. So the whole return to office movement now is how do we get people back in? If we, for my issue, I'm trying to get some people to stay at home, to be honest. Um, but um, we've got data from our access cards that we can actually understand what time of the day people are starting to come in and leave and we're trying to flatten down those peaks so that, you know, if we're working in with what transport want us to do, which is come in and catch transport at different times of the day, trying to get a better spread across the day, looking at technology where we can use apps where people can book in where they may want to, when they might be coming into the office and moving down a path where potentially... Um, 
I know the whole of government is looking at building government hubs where staff can work at different locations, but potentially even setting up our own health hubs where, you know, if you are living in Gosford, you can work in the Gosford office. If you're living in Parramatta, going there. So still remote working, but in an office, whether that alleviates some of the issues around ergonomics or um, even access to printing facilities or collaborating at different areas where maybe teams come together and, you know, um, can come together closer to home so that they don't have to travel as much. So thinking outside of the box of just, you know, working at home, but working remotely in general. Um, right. Yeah. I think one more thing I want to touch on is one of the things we've found with a lot of people working from home is that I think we're a bit worried about innovation loss. You know, you lose those sort of water cooler moments where people bump into each other. And, and certainly I've been surprised by, you know, as you see more people, you sort of realise, oh, and you have those conversations that you don't have if you were all working from home. So that, I think that's the biggest thing that we're missing as well and how we manage that, I don't know. No, that's a, I mean, that's a really good point. And I think some of the te techniques of, of collaboration um, where you do have a hybrid environment where a few people in the office, few people remotely, being able to have that, that comfort level of still having idea um, germination and, and yeah. generation um, and the comfort level of being able to share in a two-dimensional world rather than just a three-dimensional, I think, mm -hmm. is something which will culturally we will move forward with. And I think that's something which segues me to the summary, and that is that you've heard a lot of great ideas, a lot of things that organisations have been put into play um, through necessity, through demand, not necessarily always through design. Um, there's been security concerns. There are technology concerns of being able to have um, an, enough technology to cope with um, the, the transition and business continuity. We've heard enablement concerns around making sure we're enabling the workforce at the same rate, managerial concerns of how do we manage people at the best way we can. Um, but the great thing is that people are thinking very openly um, about the challenge and putting some great ideas in place. Um, forums like this just put things um, to the table for us to capitalise on. Um, industry leaders, whether they be IT centric, without my lens of, of unified communications and technology for video conferencing and better audio and better voice to to industry specific, whether it be in the health or, or education or other segments. The great thing is one size isn't going to fit all when it comes to working from home, working back in the office, how fast you move back to the office. But it is a case that we've got to be adaptive. This term hybrid is hybrid education, hybrid health, hybrid, hybrid, hybrid working is becoming a very standard way of thinking that we've just got to have a balance. But it does affect us all. It is affecting us all. Um, incredibly resilient as we all are. It is taking effect on us. Um, but it is exciting times to come. I think it does present us with great opportunities. I really want to thank the panellists for uh, their open and candid um, comments through this. It never seems enough time. Um, we always seem to um, have um, so much more to, to concentrate on. There's been some really great comments and questions coming through the question section. We will get to those and we will answer those um, and get them back and post them. Thank you for the polls. The polls have given us some interesting insights into a couple of dimensions of this topic as well. Um, but the challenge of, of being able to define where the next workspace and workplace is going to be is up to all of us. Um, and we are being adaptive and being collaborative in the process. So thank you so much for all your time. Um, I have gone three minutes over, but I, I do um, want to thank the panelists specifically um, and thank everybody for attending. Very much appreciate your time, and I'm sure you found this useful. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.